I've been putting it off because the reading month in September was kind of meh, but let's talk about the eight books that I managed to get to. Hi guys, welcome, welcome back. Bienvenue and all that jazz. It's time to talk about some books, I guess. <laughs> so I did manage to get to eight different books in the month of September. And on top of that, I also DNF'd some books for the first time. Legit DNF. Are you proud of me? But I'll circle back to the DNFs at the end of this video because I'm sure I'll have not very many positive things to say. So before anything else, let's just jump into some stats. So like I said, I read eight books. I had two DNFs, so of the eight completed books, that totaled up to 3,244 pages, which obviously is not, like, terrible, but in comparison to my average reading month, that's not fantastic. And I think my average star rating was in the high threes. So I'll input it on the screen because I haven't done the math yet, but I had one two-star book, one three-star book, one 3.75 star book, one four star, three four point two five stars, and one four point five. So it was fine. Like about half the books I in like enjoyed, and then like half the books was a negative to half and half negative positive type experience. So it was just kind of meh vibes. But I was sick for a few weeks with everybody's favorite virus. So I think that kind of put a damper on it. And one of the first books I got to this month really just like was not the tea. <laughs> If, if you have been watching my channel and I have a review for that book, so you probably already know what it is. So let's just jump straight into the books in ascending star order, shall we? So the first book I'll talk to you about, which was my least favorite book of the month, was Babel by R.F. Kuang. And I don't know if it's just because I've been in like a snarky, like kind of annoyed reading mood, or if it's because the book is really just not my vibe. But I did not enjoy Babel. I basically feel like if you strip away the kind of cool linguista, linguista, linguistics, my good, the, if you strip away the kind of cool linguistics stuff, then it's kind of a basic story and I don't find it that interesting. And it's kind of an irritating one for me because I feel like with the linguistics and kind of that whole vibe with the footnotes and stuff, it's trying to lean really hard into feeling academic. But then with the way that it explores the themes of colonialism and racism and sexism and like some of those really important topics, it is so on the nose with them that it feels like it's targeted towards a younger audience. So I'm like, okay, but like a younger audience with an academic, it's just like a weird tone that just did not really work for me personally and I just did not vibe with this book. If you want more details, I rant on and on about this book. I have a whole review that I'll post on the screen and down below to have more thoughts on Babel if you want them. But that book deserves no more of my energy, time, thought, anything, so let's just chug right along. The next book that I'll talk to you about is Miss Peregrine's Museum of Wonders and I gave this book three stars. And I didn't give it three stars because it's bad. It's just a like companion expanding the world type book. So it's not like a book book with a plot or anything like that. It's set in the world of the Miss Peregrine's Home for Peculiar Children series. It's just more information about the peculiar world. And so there's some fun Easter eggs in there and it definitely has like some spoilery aspects to it. So you definitely don't want to read this book until you've read the rest of the series. And it's just if you want more information on the peculiar world. So it's just kind of like a fun little companion type more info world building type book. Then I also read Summer Night by Jim Butcher. This is book four in the Dresden Files. And I can see why people say that this is where the world really starts to expand and you start to get some more interesting like expansive type plots. I won't say much but this one Harry Dresden basically gets caught in a conflict between the Seely and Unseely Fay courts and it's just fun. So I have yet to feel like any super attachment to any of the characters or anything like that in the Dresden Files books. But I will say that this one was the most fun I've had so far. So I did give it 3.75 stars because Harry was less annoying. There was less of the pervy skull bob or whatever. Like some of the parts that I kind of like roll my eyes at. Harry's becoming less of a misogynistic kind of annoying dude. So that's all great. And the plots are kind of more expansive and kind of more intricate. And so I'll definitely continue with the series whenever I feel like it, <laughs> but I enjoyed this one more than the previous three, and so we'll see. Then I also read The Sunbearer Trials. This is the new book by Aidan Thomas. It's the first book in the Sunbearer duology, I want to say it's supposed to be. I gave this book four stars, and it's not because of anything bad. So I know a lot of people are shouting about this book right now, and the few people that I know that have read it have, like, really loved it. 
But for me, so the kind of setup for this world is basically we live in a land of different gods and goddesses. There are like the major deities, which are the gold deities that literally have gold blood. And then there's the kind of more minor deities, which are the jade deities, which have green blood. And then there was previously this other class of deities known as the Obsidians. They're kind of like the evil deities that have been locked out of the world basically by the sacrifice of the sun god. He also like imbued these sunstones that each temple of each god and goddess in this world has one that keeps the evil deities out of the world at night because during the day the sun keeps them out of the world. And so every 10 years there is this competition known as the Sunbearer Trials to decide whoever wins gets to lead the kind of campaign to go from temple to temple to renew these sunstones for the next 10 years. But in order to do this, they have to literally sacrifice and kill whoever loses the Sunbearer Trials. And their life force is what helps renew these sunstones to keep the evil deities out of this world. And so we get to travel around this really cool, fantastical, very Latin-inspired fantasy world where each city is ruled by a patron god or goddess and so it very much has the flavor of whatever their power is. So like the earth gods live in a volcano, the one of our main characters, he his mom is like the god of goddess of birds and stuff so their temple is built to allow all these birds to nest there and so it's just all these cool different powers and so the cream of the crop get chosen and they travel from city to city competing in the sun bearer trials. And so if you like magical competitions and all of that kind of stuff, this book is great. It's like magical competitions with a darker edge because obviously we know whoever loses is going to be sacrificed in order to renew this cycle. So we follow a trans male protagonist, which is fantastic. There is a very slow burn, will they, won't they, male, male romance involving this trans male character. That's all great. The main issue I have with this book is that it very much is like fantasy, its own world, but then it's like this kind of weird, it feels very much like our world because then like the slang and stuff that they're using is very 2022 street slang. And even when we're talking about how our main character transitioned, it talks about using testosterone, which they abbreviate as T. So it's all these like very much like modern slang, but then we're in this kind of like almost ancient feeling, as techie feeling type world. And so just like that juxtaposition of those two different things kind of didn't work totally for me, but I totally understand this is definitely young adult. There is swearing and lots of violence and stuff like that. So I would not classify this as a middle grade tale. So I understand that like, if you are like a teen who's thinking about transitioning or whatever, that having that familiar terminology is really probably helpful. So it's just me as a 30 something year old ancient gay man that just like that weird clashing of the very modern language but the kind of not modern setting. I usually don't notice that kind of thing but like even they had a they had apps that are basically like Instagram and they called it Instagraphia and so it's just like it was just so modern world but not so it's just weird and so that was the one part that kind of didn't work for me but the characters I had a great time with the competition itself was a whole lot of fun, so I would highly recommend you check out this book. Then I also got to The Daughter of the Moon Goddess, finally by Su Lin Tan. This book I gave 4.25 stars, and I had a lot of fun with this book as well. For both of these books, it's the plot and the characters that I really enjoyed, but then there are some other aspects that I didn't. So the aspects of The Daughter of the Moon Goddess that I really did not enjoy it was kind of the romantical aspects. There's definitely like a love triangle at the core of this story. And this book is technically marketed in the U.S., as adult. Like if you look at the price of the hardback, where it's typically shelved, it's an adult book. And so just the kind of like angsty pining that felt more geared towards like a teen audience, but in an adult book. And so like, I just didn't love those aspects. But the romance aspects are such a small part of the story, in my opinion. I feel like the parts of the story that really kind of drive it forward is the kind of familial aspects, because this book is about, we have our main character who is obviously the daughter of the moon goddess and the moon goddess is basically imprisoned on the moon because she drank an elixir of immortality that was not meant for her and so in order to save her child and so now she's kind of stuck there and she has hidden the fact that she has a child from the entire like celestial court and so one day the celestial empress comes to pay a visit and things ensue the daughter has to flee and kind of make her own way in the celestial kingdom and so I feel like that aspect of the story is really what drives this story forward. It's that whole like 
wanting to do your best for your family. And like the romance plots were fine. They didn't do anything for me personally. And the kind of interesting thing about the nature of this book, it's separated into three parts. So the first part is kind of our main character getting situated in the world after having lived in that cloistered environment in the moon for so long, kind of getting a foothold in the world. And then the second part, she joins the military and we get to follow her adventures in the military. Then the third part is a larger conflict within this world kind of coming to fruition. And there are some twists and turns, especially in part three, that I didn't see coming that I thoroughly enjoyed. And the fighting is magic is super cool. They ride around on clouds, they manipulate elements, like all of it's super fun. It's just interesting to me because this book almost feels like a novelization of like a TV show because there are these like specific episodic pieces of the book on all these different adventures. And we never really see the in-between times. We kind of just bounce from adventure to adventure to adventure, which I normally would appreciate, but I also would have appreciated kind of the world was so cool that I would have liked to have more time seeing these in-between moments to kind of get the world fleshed out as a whole better. So it is a lot of fun. And if you are particularly just like you want to have those really fast moments with no lulls, this is the perfect book for you. If you're looking for like the best romance where it's like so integral to the plot, I don't know that I would say that this is necessarily the book. Like the romance and the love triangle do play a role in the plot, but like I don't know that I needed it to be there in order for the plot to feel similar. So I have mixed feelings, <laughs> but overall very positive feelings about Daughter of the Moon Goddess. And I will definitely be checking out the next book, which is coming out soon. Then I got to read How to Succeed in Witchcraft by Aislinn Brophy. And this book is kind of like, it feels very much like Sabrina the Teenage Witch if Sabrina was a half black lesbian witch. And so there are a whole lot of issues that our main character is dealing with due to her race and her sexual orientation. And so I really enjoyed this book. It's very much that kind of like slice of life high school type witch show, which is why I would compare it to something like Sabrina. And there are magical elements. Our main character loves doing potion making. So she makes all these cool potions in her spare time and at her job. And basically what's happening is she is from a poorer family and goes to this kind of fancy preparatory type school. And in this world, there are different kinds of colleges. There are licensing colleges and then non-licensing colleges. And it's kind of similar to, I don't know how you would probably like a university versus like a community college, I would say, because the university, the licensing college kind of opens the doors to you for higher level positions. Whereas if you go to a non-licensing college, there is kind of that glass ceiling that people encounter. And so our main character's dream is to go to a licensing college to be able to kind of give back to her family that has sacrificed so much for her to go to this really fancy school. And so she's really focused on getting this particular scholarship that could help facilitate that for her. And there are things that arise, sapphic romance. It's just a whole lot of fun and deals with some really complicated themes of how far are you willing to go? There are some kind of elements of grooming and just nasty not great subjects that are examined in this kind of witchy world. And so I really appreciated this book for kind of approaching those topics and not really shying away from them. And so I really had a good time with this book. But if you're somebody just who's more sensitive to that kind of stuff, then I don't know if this is the book for you. You probably want to look up more trigger warnings about it. Then I also got to the 99 Boyfriends of Micah Summers. And this was just a fun contemporary male male romance written by a gay male author, which you all know I have been on the hunt for for quite some time. And it gave me everything that I was hoping for. This one is by Adam Sass. And I gave it 4.25 stars. So in this one, we follow our main character, Micah. And he is kind of obsessed with finding love. And so he has all these crushes on all these boys. And when he has a crush on a boy, he's also a very talented artist. And so he kind of draws them through a fantastical lens as like a pirate or a merman or whatever, and posts them onto this kind of like anonymous Instagram page that he maintains and has these kind of cute stories that go along with it. And so he has done 99 of these previously, and he hopes that for boy 100 to be his first boyfriend. And so there's a meet cute on a train that feels very like gay Cinderella. And he's just obsessed with like that whole fairy tale romance. And so I'm annoyed at some of the things. The reason it only got 4.25 stars and not higher is because it was just kind of those cliche, like heteronormative type romance situations, but also they were really cute. So like I was, 
I was like torn about it, do you know what I mean? Where I was like, oh God, why does it have to be like so heteronormative, but also like it's so cute. And it's just a lot of fun. So if you're just looking for a cute, fun, contemporary, queer romance by a queer author, I would highly recommend you check it out. And then my favorite book of the month, is technically a reread, but after reading this, I had remembered absolutely nothing about this story. And I know a lot of people, I don't put rereads in my bit, 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 bit. I don't really care. Like I'm kind of comparing everything on equal footing. So if a book can beat out a all time favorite reread, then good for you. And if you can't, then you didn't. So my favorite book of the month was Shadows of Self by Brandon Sanderson. I read this while I was in the throes of the Rony Roan and so <laughs> it was just the brain candy that I needed. It felt like watching a CSI episode which I used to love watching all the CSI episodes with my mom and my husband when I was growing up and what I mean my husband and I have been together almost 14 years so like it's been a long time and so it just brought up like those nostalgia for watching that kind of procedural crime drama but then also it was set in a fantastical world that I happened to be biased to love already because I love era one of Mistborn and so being back in Skadrial with some of those characters is great and then the Candra from era one kind of pop back up and we get some cameos of stuff and it's just so good so fun and so I just thoroughly enjoyed this. I do know that era two for a lot of people they have a hard time getting into it because people tend to read era one and then go immediately into era two and the kind of drastic shift in tone is difficult for them. So just know if you're ever going to check out Era 2 of Mistborn, it is much more campy, crime procedural, fun, kind of western-ish, western steampunky vibes. So just know that if you ever want to check out these books. And so we do have a live show that we discussed Shadows of Self, so I'll link that in the description down below if you want more kind of spoilery thoughts about Shadows of Self. And the Era 2 Mistborn read-along continues this month with the Bands of Mourning, we have a reading sprint coming up this coming Friday, and then I think the week after is the live show. Just look out in my community tab, I'll post all the deets. So that wraps up all of the things that I actually finished reading, and then I did have two DNFs. The first of which is a very hard DNF. I read like maybe 15% of it, and then I was just like, absolutely not. And that would be The Kind Worth Killing by Peter Swanson. I got, no, okay, so I got 35% in it. I gave it a good, the good college try. And I've just come to terms with the fact that these, what are they called? I think they're called domestic thrillers are just not for me. Everybody sucks and I just don't enjoy watching it. Like I don't mind messy drama, but I, this isn't just messy drama. This is just everybody is a horrible human being <laughs> doing horrible things to each other. And so it's basically like this guy, his wife is cheating on him and he has this random run in with this woman in the airport and she like encourages him to kill his wife and so he's thinking about killing his wife because she's cheating on him and then we kind of find out more about this woman and maybe some things that she had done in her past because she was sexually assaulted by a family member in her past and so maybe did things to that family member and it's just like I don't enjoy this kind of story I don't enjoy this domestic thriller I don't there's nobody to root for everybody's horrible and horrible things happen to everybody and so I'm just Absolutely not. So that is a hard DNF and I don't know that I will ever give another domestic thriller a try. I do kind of like mystery thriller or murder mystery thriller. So if you have maybe some recommendations more in that lane rather than domestic thrillers, I'd love to hear them because I kind of, like that CSI vibes, like that kind of stuff I really enjoy. But like this is just not doing it for me. And then the other one, I, I call it a soft DNF for now because I don't know when I plan to come back to it, but I also don't know that I'm completely throwing in the towel. And that would be the first binding by R.R. Verity. I did get in about 30% to this book and just... So... <laughs> so I... <laughs> I would describe the writing style as basically masturbatory. I feel like the descriptions aren't like these lush, vibrant descriptions. It's just he wants to describe friggin' everything to the point where I'm just like, are you sitting in a dark room with a fistful of lotion and kind of like, uh, like, I just, I don't get it. I don't get the hype. It's so slow. It's so boring. I don't need to know what everybody's friggin' nose looks like. Like, down, do I need to know what their nose hairs look like too? Like, bro, come on. Like, and it's just nothing particularly interesting has happened yet. I do know that it's like an 800 page chonker and it feels very slow burn. And I normally don't mind that. 
And that's why I give it a softy enough for now because I just don't know, like, is it me and I'm having a cranky reading mood in September? Or is it really this book is just not for me? I haven't totally decided. So I probably will pick it up maybe in November or December and give it another try and see if I get more gripped. But currently that is just not, not the tea for me. <laughs> But that wraps up all of the books that I managed to get to in the month of September. Have you read any of these? Have any thoughts? Feels? What was your favorite read in the month of September? I'd love to just hear from you and have some chats down in those comments down below. And like always, while you're down there, go ahead and hit that like button. Subscribe if you haven't already for more bookish shenanigans like this from moi. Other than that, I hope you have a great rest of your day and I'll talk to you again soon. Bye!